Welcome to another Coach Greg video. I'm super excited today to have my buddy, Dr. Stan Beecham with me. Welcome, Stan. How are you doing? Good to be here. I'm doing well. Excellent. Uh, many of you know Dr. Stan because I reference him all the time, but he's a sports psychologist, also works with a lot of business leaders. Anybody trying to kind of go to the highest level, be a, have a peak performance, he's the man they turn to. I actually uh, hired Dr. Stan to work with my Olympic development team of athletes because what I realized early on was that uh, half the battle was the X's and O's of getting them fit. The other half was helping them believe they could actually do and achieve these great goals, the big goals that they had, like winning a national championship, going to the world championships, or even the Olympics. Uh, so I thought I'd invite Dr. Stan to join me for some of these coach update videos, and we could talk about some of the things that go on in the runner's brain, and uh, from his experience, get some ideas on how we can uh, incorporate things he's learned from his work with elite performers uh, to try to uh, do our best on race day. And Dr. Stan, what I wanted to talk about today is something that comes up frequently, which is you do all this training to get ready for a big race. And you obviously have your ups and your downs across the two, three, four, five months that you're training. But then right. as the race gets close, you kind of start to freak out. You start to have a ton of anxiety and doubt and worry. And it sort of can consume athletes, even though they've kind of built themselves into great physical shape. They start to have a lot of uh, sort of mental issues going into the race. So how did, well, tell us about this sort of weird anxiety that happens as you're getting ready for a performance. Yeah, well, actually, anxiety is a, is a very normal uh, experience. And in fact, it actually plays a role in evolution and keeping us alive. And so what I thought I would do is, is talk about just what anxiety is in general sense and to support anticipatory anxiety, if you will, because the, the process that makes you anxious before a race is the same process that might make you anxious before say a job interview. Okay. And what I find is, is that people frequently don't really understand how anxiety happens inside of them and because they don't really understand it they feel as if it's something that's happening to them right what's interesting is when you talk to people about anxiety frequently the experience is, is why is this happening to me and the reality is is it's not happening to you you're actually creating it internally but you don't know that you're creating which sounds kind of crazy right it's like <laughs> Why would I do this to myself? Right. And, 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 there, and there's actually a good reason. And, and so I want to back up a little bit uh, a couple of hundred uh, million years ago or a couple of hundred thousand years, rather. So the brain that we have right now, the scientists say it's between 250 and 300,000 years old. OK, so think about that. It's changed a little bit, but but mostly it's the same. And what's happened over time is this brain has gotten really good at one thing and one thing only, and that's keeping you alive. And so what you got to understand is that's the brain's number one job is how does it keep you alive another day? Now, what's interesting now is uh, from, say, even a thousand years ago is there's not a lot of threats to us. Right. I mean, if you think about like what what's going on in your life right now that you should really be worried about. And the answer is anything that threatens your physical existence, right? Mm -hmm. So in other words, if, if you're in the woods and, and you hear a large animal coming your way and you get this what we call sympathetic nervous system arousal, right, which kind of gets you startled and it actually helps you run really fast and really far, it keeps you alive so it serves a purpose, mm -hmm. okay? The, the, the fact of the matter is most of us and most of the people listening to this, they don't have anything physical or real to be anxious about anymore. In other words, there's no real threat to your life. OK, but yet the brain is searching for a threat. You with me? Uh -huh. and, and so what, what's happened evolutionary wise is if there is a threat and your brain misses it, well, now you're out of the population, right? <laughs> right. But if you develop a brain that's really good at picking up any potential threat and reacting to it and even overreacting, which you could argue anxiety is, the benefit is that it keeps you alive. You, you see that? And is that sort of what's going on when we have this, this upcoming event that is important to us and we care about it? Our brain right. is starting to kind of go right. into this cycle 
sort yes. of that it, it doesn't need to, but it's sort of programmed to right. do that. Right. Yes. So, so the brain is good at picking up any potential threat, right? And then once the brain perceives that there's a threat, it's going to change internally what's going on. It's going to change your brain chemistry. You've heard of things like cortisol and you've heard right. of things called sympathetic nervous system arousal. Yeah. So basically what happens is the whole body gets kind of, think about it as you're normally running on regular gas and now you're pumping high test, right? Mm -hmm. And what I'm saying is what I want people to understand is there, there's a there, there's a beneficiary aspect to that that it keeps you alive. Here, here's the problem: is there is no real threat to you. And 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 again, though, what the brain wants to do is it wants to it wants to keep you uh, alive and it wants to help you survive. But if you think about, so why do people survive and some people don't? Well, the people that survive, they have what they you know the psychologists talk about dominance. In other words. The fact of the matter is people who can run faster, people who are stronger, they have a survival advantage, right? Mm -hmm. Just like now, people who have, say, more money so they can have safer housing, better food, uh, those kinds of things, there's a benefit to that. that. That's why today people get so worked up about making more money. It's not so much that the money that you want, but it's just that when you have those physical things, it makes you safer, mm -hmm. Okay. So what your brain is trying to do, and the reason that you want to win a race is that anytime you're in a dominant position, in other words, if you're beating me and we're running, you, you can say, hey, it feels good to win. But what I'm saying is we're hardwired for that. So the fact of the matter is when you go into a race, you want to do well, okay? But going into a race now, running fast, it's not going to keep you alive, right? In other words, let's say you're training for a marathon. Let's say you want to run an eight-minute pace, so you want to run a 3.30 marathon, okay? Well, let's say I end up running a 3.45 marathon. What, what's different now? <laughs> and no, no, seriously. I mean, what's, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm not in any danger, right? In fact, slowing down a little bit, maybe that kept me alive because <laughs> the mechanism says, you know, you can't stay at this pace, you're going to die. But, but what's happening now, so when you think about the people that you're coaching, one of the reasons that we want to do well in a race is because if we don't do well, we're somehow embarrassed by that. There's an aspect of social humiliation, right? In other words, I, I, I want people to perceive me positively. I want people to think that, you know, I'm worthy and that I'm strong and that I'm competent. And so for people who do kind of, you know, um, not, not the professional runners that, that you and I have worked with and work with, but when you talk about more of a recreational runner, mm -hmm. you know, what's on the line for a recreational runner or a person who wants to run their first marathon? It, 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 it's, it's not survival, right? It's, right. It's, they don't want to be embarrassed. Yeah, and it seems like, it's, you know, a lot of times they put a goal out or they have some particular, right. you know, it's such a black and white sport a lot of times with, what time did you run? And you have these barriers. I want to break four hours or three thirty or whatever yes. it is. We have these, and most runners are pretty goal oriented. So right. that whether you achieve that or not it begins to rise in its level of importance. And I wonder is that part of the triggering of yes. why all of a sudden, as it gets close, we start to worry, am I going to do it? Am I not going to do it? And what does that mean? And what if I don't? And, you know, right. so you can really spend a lot of time in your own head that way. And so when I work with people, you know, if I was working with someone who had, say, a lot of, you know, kind of uh, pre-race pre -race anxiety, the question I would say is, let's say you don't break 3.30 in the marathon, okay, which is your goal. Mm -hmm. Now what happens to you? Now what? How, in other words, tell me how your life is different. And the answer is it's not, other than the fact that I might be embarrassed, right? So when I see my buddies at the finish line, let's say I'm training with a group of people and we all trying to run a, you know, 3.30 marathon. Let's say you guys all make it and I don't, right? I'm embarrassed and I feel bad, right? Now, if you go back a couple of thousand years, if the bear's chasing us, well, I'm the one the bear got. <laughs> no, seriously. Yeah. So the, the fact that I couldn't keep pace, I would die. Yeah. And so what I'm saying is th the fact that something like anxiety, okay, and fear, what I want people to understand is there's a real purpose to have that, and it's an evolutionary purpose, mm -hmm. okay? But when you're getting ready to run a 10K or your first marathon or whatever, you're trying to break a time, 
what's really helpful for people in managing their anxiety is simply ask the question, okay, I have a goal, I've trained hard, but if I don't hit this goal, what happens next? And the answer is nothing. Yeah. Right. It seems like it's a balance, right? Because the anxiety and having a purpose and being sort of focused and driven to succeed is, is a really positive part of it. Yes. But then I also, a lot of times, and I, I think you've seen this as well, sometimes say an athlete, they get sick a couple of weeks before the race, or they have a little niggly injury. And then yeah. suddenly the pressure goes away because they don't longer have an expectation that they may even run their goal. And then and they that- run great. They run amazing during that. So it's this balance of like, yeah. you know, utilizing focus and sort of the ramping up of the right. mental system to perform yeah with not letting it eat you alive because that's what i I see a lot of times is you know the last couple of weeks before a marathon that's the tapering period people are sort of you know running less and uh, it's finally here and and then they really kind of worry themselves to death about the race and sometimes they have spent so much mental energy going into it Right. that they really can't perform up to the level that they're training. Well, they, uh, they've exhausted you. themselves. Yeah, exactly. If, if you think about stress, which is kind of a hyper alert, so you're, mm-hmm. you know, Im- imagine you're at war, right? And you're having to stay up throughout the night to make sure no one, you know, attacks your village. Right. If you put yourself under that kind of stress over a long period of time, you're going to essentially wear yourself down, right? You, you essentially expend all of your energy, mm-hmm. right? I'm sure that's something you talk with runners about right. from a physical standpoint. Well, if you keep yourself stressed out for a period of time, you're going to also burn a lot of energy and you're going to be exhausted, mm-hmm. right? But the, you made a good point earlier, which is, you know, people sometimes during their training, they, they have an injury and so they miss a few weeks or – you know, something happens to them, they, you know, they get sick, they get a cold and they can't run a few days. And then you find out that they actually run really well. Yeah. And, and so part of what happens in that is now you have an excuse. Okay. So in other words, if, if I got sick during my training and I missed a piece of it, if I don't run the, the goal that I wanted to, I can say, well, you know, I got the flu and I couldn't run for a week. Right. Or I got sick or you know, I had shin splints really bad and I had to take a week off. And, and again, people aren't doing this consciously, mm-hmm. right? It, but when you really understand how the mind works, and, and so what I'm saying to most of these people who have anxiety, the, the terrible thing is, is embarrassment or humiliation, right? So when you have a reason why you can't hit the goal, right, it gives you an out. Right. Now, now, the, now the secret is, is to not have to get sick you know, or injure yourself so that you can save face. Mm-hmm. Right? And so, again, you go back to, to asking yourself, you know, if this doesn't go the way I want it to go, what's the terrible thing that's going to happen to me? And, and the answer is nothing. Right. Interesting, interesting enough, when, when Tiger Woods was just starting his professional career, remember he went to Stanford and played mm-hmm. for a couple of years and he went professional? And, of course, people had watched him because he won, you know, a lot of junior tournaments right. and, I remember early in his career, he was being interviewed and the person interviewing him, I wish I could remember the exact interview, but I remember the quote. They said, what's the worst thing that's ever happened to you playing golf? And his answer was nothing. It's golf. (laughs) And so, yes. And what I'm, what I'm saying to people, it's okay to take running seriously, but you don't have to take yourself seriously. Mm -hmm. You with me? So in other words, I think if you pour yourself into something like running and you take it seriously and you dedicate yourself, the, 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 the benefit of it is has the capacity to transform you, to make you a stronger, more confident person, right? We know that when people choose difficult things to do and they challenge themselves, you know, and they continue to grow, not only they continue to grow and develop, but these people have more joy in their life, mm-hmm. right? So part of being depressed or feeling stuck is when you get stagnant. So one of the things that's really beneficiary to people who run or do exercise over time is not only are you keeping your body strong, right? And you're say expanding your endurance, but there's a a lot of psychological benefits to that, right? In other words, people who have meaning in their life, the people who really enjoy their life, they choose to do things that are challenging. 
So I would say to the person who is has some pre-race anxiety, the fact that say say something like a marathon, okay, mm-hmm. or just the distance you haven't gone before, right. the fact that you chose to do this, the fact that you trained to do this, the fact that you're actually in a place now where you're physically able to do it, and you're able to tell people that, right, when you work with them, you can say you've done the work, you now have the ability to run a marathon. Just doing that is is tremendously beneficial. And what I would hate for is a person to put all that work in and then steal, you know, the joy and the benefit away from themselves. Right. Because they ran, you know, a 10 K a minute and a half slower than they wanted to. Right. And I think most people will agree with that intellectually. They, they know, you know, wow, mostly I'm just happy to be able to run and you'd be thankful yeah. for just the opportunity to do it. And that seems to be, I think what, Uh, people run into as a big race gets close is intellectually, yes, they know they're not paying their mortgage by how well they run. And even though there's now Strava and everybody knows every run that you do and all of your race results, it's all out there for public display. And ultimately it doesn't matter, you know, but then emotionally you have trained hard and you do have this big event and it right. sounds like one of the things that can be helpful to runners in that situation is number one, realize it's normal that you would be anxious and you would have some anxiety and concern going into something that your brain is yes. perceiving as, hey, this is a big deal. This is a meaningful yes. thing. But right. making sure that you don't sort of go down that road too much and burn too much mental energy, that you have some perspective. And you're able to kind of, whenever you start to have those feelings, maybe take a step back and refocus on some things that give you some perspective so that you can take advantage of being, you know, excited about challenging yourself, but not sort of worried too much about the outcome that you can't sort of get out of your own way and yeah. allow yourself. I mean, you hear that all the times with athletes, right? It's like whenever yeah. it worked really well, I wasn't even thinking. It just flowed. I had no thoughts. It just happened. That's Versus right. You have a lot of people have anxiety going into events and it, it wears them down. Yeah. Anxiety is, is being hyper aware of self. Mm-hmm. People get into the flow state. There is no self. Right. Which right. is really interesting. It is like, it's the opposite, right? It's like, You're anxious because you want this great performance, but ultimately if you could not be anxious, but just allow yourself to go and perform probably like you've proven several times in the training process leading up to it, you would actually have a better performance and you can go into the race more relaxed. You don't have to stress about it. You can just let it happen. Here's, here's another thing to think about is Let's, let's, let's say you're a recreational runner, but you're really serious, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, you're going at it hard. Does, does one race define you as a runner? Right. No, it doesn't, right? It's one race. Mm-hmm. And, and, and in fact, you know, you hear the saying, life is a game. I would say, no, life is not a game. It's a series of games. Yeah. If you're a competitive runner, your um, uh, reputation as a runner is not based upon one race. It's based upon what you did over over a course of time. So if you, if you run enough races, just like if you run enough days, you're going to have a bad day. Mm -hmm. Anybody who's been a competitor for a long period of time, they had a day where it just didn't work. Well, you know, welcome to the human race, right? (laughs) Yeah. So the other thing I would say to a person who's really anxious is, you know, this race is not going to define you. And and in fact, what I find is that when people struggle or even fail to do what they want to do, those experiences are much more informative than the successes in life. You know, it's interesting. We we, we hang our trophies and and our diplomas up on the wall, right? Because that's the part we want people to see. I, I would say the reality is the thing that really makes us and really defines us are the things that didn't go our way, right? Right. And so the other thing that, that, that is important to understand is, is we need struggle. In other words, we need things to not go our way. And so people who have pre-race anxiety, a lot of these people, they think that there's only one way they can run the race, right? Mm -hmm. It has to go this way. Mm -hmm. And what I would suggest to that person is, is 
No, there's a, let's say I'm trying to run a, let's just use that example of an eight minute marathon, yeah. a 330. Yeah. There's an infinite number of ways of running a 330 marathon, isn't there? Right. right. And so you may have in your mind this way or this plan, if you will, you know, I'm going to run, you know, the first part this way, I'm going to run the middle this way. I'm, you know, you know, cause you, you work with people on that and, and it's good to have a plan, but you know, like Mike Tyson said, everybody has a plan. <laughs> right. 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 <laughs> Part of what I want people to do is, yes, have a plan, but also understand there's a good chance that it's not going to go exactly the way I want to, mm -hmm. right? Like you might, you know, a lot of marathoners, you say, okay, when when do you really start hurting? When does it really get bad? And what would you tell them? 18, 16, 20 miles? Yeah, you're apart? hoping it's pretty deep into the race for sure. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I just talked to a guy who's a triathlete and a good one, and he cramped up in the swim. Oh, my. And he said, this has never happened to me before. You know, and he goes, I was in the best shape of my life. He goes, I never thought that was coming. And I said, it really bothered you, right? Because you didn't think of that happening. And he said, yeah. And he was able to kind of, you know, adjust and move on. Mm -hmm. But, you know, especially with ro longer runs, I mean, you got to accept the fact that you don't know what's going to happen next, right? Yeah. So when I, when I talk to groups of people, you know, one of the things I say is stop acting as if the future is real. Yeah. You know, and I get this weird look. And I go, well, let's talk about what is the future because anxiety is about the future for the most part, right? Right, right. So here's the deal. How many of us know what's going to happen tomorrow? None, Zero. right? <laughs> but we all have thoughts about tomorrow and we all have plans. You might have a schedule about tomorrow. Mm -hmm. but, but we act as if our thoughts of ourselves, what we're going to do tomorrow, what's going to happen tomorrow. We, we, we think about it so much. We act as if that's actually how it's going to go. The reality is your plans or your future is just the fictitious story that you've made up because you don't know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. In other words, we make ourselves anxious. Okay. We make ourselves afraid because the story that we made up in our head scares us. Right. You follow me? Right. It's just kind of like, you know, with a child who, you know, wakes up in the middle of the night and they're crying and you go check on your kid and you go, what's wrong, honey? And, you know, Angus says, there's a monster in my room, you know, right? You turn the lights on and you, and you go, I don't see a monster. He goes, well, it's under the bed, right? So you get down <laughs> look under the bed. Well, it's, you know, it's in the closet, right? And you look in the closet and you look all over and, and, you know, you, you show the kid there's not a monster. W w where is the monster? It's in his head, Right. 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 And, and who made up the monster? The child did. Mm -hmm. okay. That's exactly what we do as adults when we get ourselves really worked up and nervous is we actually are making up a monster in our head. The, pro the reason that it scares us is that we don't realize that we made up the monster, right? So mm -hmm. if, if, you, if you apply that to a race, let's say you're running a race this weekend, right? You don't know what's going to happen. You might get in that race and feel great. You might get into it in the first mile you know, something really bad happens. You just don't, you don't know. Mm -hmm. But what you're going to do before the race is, is you're going to think about the race, right? And you're going to imagine how the race goes. Now, are there any limits on how you get to do that? And the answer is no, you can, right? You can make up tomorrow any way you want to. So part of what's important for people who have a tendency to be anxious is for them to identify what's the story that you're telling yourself about the race that's making you anxious. Okay. In other words, it's not happening to you. Some outside source is not in, you know, injecting anxiety into you. you're doing it to yourself. You just don't know you're doing it to yourself. Mm -hmm. And for most people in competitive sport, they're doing it by thinking that this isn't going to go well. Right. Or they think about, you know, you know, what if my shoelace breaks? What if my, the person who's supposed to bring my water at so-and-so mile isn't there? Yeah. You know, if my food's not there. And so when you think about all these things, yes, you get anxious because it's a threat to your survival. But the other part of it is you can think about, well, if that happens, I can do this, right? Because, I mean, right. most people, especially people who run really long races, they all have a story, right? Yeah, right. Of about, you know, the, you know, the terrible thing that happened. <laughs> yeah fell off the side of the mountain, you know, my shoe came off, right. you know, whatever it is. I mean, people who've been in sport for a while, they all have stories like that. And the reality is the more adversity that you deal with, right. The more uncertainty that you accept and deal with the better that you get at it. Mm -hmm. So part of, 
part of what you want to tell yourself is, is if I get a lot of anxiety, I haven't really gotten good at dealing with the uncertainty, right? Right. Because it's uncertain for everyone. Would you agree? I would. And one of the things I've been uh, talking to athletes about is trying to refocus a little bit and see it more as an exploration yeah. as a, yeah, I get nervous too. I race, you know, I just raced this past weekend and, you know, so yeah, I'm a little concerned about how it's going to go and I'm in this race series. So you're racing the same guys all the time. So you kind of yeah. know you're the pecking order and you're wanting to, right. you know, move up in the race, whatever it is. Yeah. But I also try to change my mind. And I do this with workouts too, because I think people also get kind of anxious for big yes. workouts. But I mm -hmm. look at it as like, I wonder what's going to happen today. I wonder what Greg is going to show up today. Because, you know, we're never the same runner every run. So okay. which one's going to show up? How am I going to feel? And how am I going to deal with that during this workout? Because sometimes I might feel great, which is, of course, what I would love to happen all the time. Right. Most of the time, that's not the case. I will have to adjust something during the workout in order to have the best result from that workout. Now, sometimes right. I feel really bad. I might have to slow down. I might have to right. cut it short or something like that, which would not have been a positive going into the workout. But based on what I was experiencing, that was actually I got the best out of that workout. Yep. So trying, I've been trying to work on this idea of like refocusing from, yeah, nervous and on doubt, that's all kind of normal that you might feel that way. But how about us looking at it as an exploration and see yep. kind of go into it with an excitement, almost like a childlike excitement of what could be yep. as yep. a way to refocus their brain? Well, you, 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 you pointed, you, you, you made a good point, which is you're talking about what's the best that I can do in that moment. Mm -hmm. And, and I talk to athletes a lot about that, right? The, the, the reality is that's all you can do at any given moment is your best, mm -hmm. right? And, and everything, so life happens in the here and now in the moment. You can think about the past and you can think about the future, but you can't do anything. All doing, all activity ha happens in the present tense. Mm -hmm. And so if you're in a race and it's not going well, ask yourself, What's the best that I can do right now in this situation? And then do that. Mm -hmm. And what I have found is, is that when people find themselves in an adverse situation, but they did the best that they could, in other words, they manage themselves, mm -hmm. when it's over, they feel good about that. Yeah. I remember yeah. learning that from you uh, many years ago now, and it's really helped me in my own racing, where I just compartmentalize every segment of the race, right? Whether it's a 5K or it's a marathon, I yeah. just kind of break it down into this section of the race. Right. How can I do my best for this section? Now, yes. sometimes my best in that section is holding back so that I don't go out too fast, right? Sometimes right. it could be, oh, I need to push a little bit harder because right. I know the trail is going to get narrow and I want to be in front of these people because it's hard to pass. Or sometimes it could be, you know, I mean, there's all kinds of different scenarios. But right. in my mind when I'm racing, I try to be more focused on what I'm doing at the moment and yes. can I run better in this segment of the race? And it really helps me. Yeah. So if, if, if you, if you think about going into a race, there's a lot of things that you don't know what's going to happen and you can focus on those and get anxious as you just said, or what you can focus on is you kind of make a pact with yourself, right? And you say, look, I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm going to do the best that I can. Okay. And I'm not going to complain about, you know, the temperature or the rain or the conditions or any of that. I'm not going to get caught up in that. Right. Mm -hmm. I know there are going to be things that don't go the way I want them to go, but I'm going to do the best that I can. And you can, you can, and you can do that. Right. And so what I'm saying is, is that that's ultimately what's in your control is in that moment. If you accept the situation that you're in, you can actually do your best. If you don't accept the situation or the conditions, you can't do your best because you're fighting reality then, right? right? So doing your best is, is in response to accepting, you know, the reality of what's happening in that moment, which right. you have no control over. It's such great information. I thank you so much. Uh, anything else on this idea of anxiety before we sign off? Um, I think we've sort of addressed the the psychological component, our history of why we kind of create this anxiety. 
And then the idea that we don't need to create that reality. We can actually change our focus. I love the idea of being the best, make a pact with yourself to be the best that you can be on the day. Right. And you, and you deserve that. You went, you went out and you trained hard and you put a lot of energy into it. And so go do the best that you can. Mm -hmm. And, and you won't know that until you get there. That's okay. The, so the, the, a couple of key points, takeaways, Greg. One is when you feel anxious or worried, you're doing that to yourself. And that doesn't mean you're a bad person, okay? But I, I make me worry. You don't make me worry. I make me worry. And so when, when, so once you understand that you're doing that to yourself, now, now you have a chance to fix it. And so where you go from there is, is, is what is the thing that I'm telling myself or what is the thing that I'm thinking that my response to that thought is to feel anxious? See if you can pinpoint it, right? And for most people, I think, who are just trying to go out and run, the, the, the fear is if I don't run a certain time, I'm going to feel embarrassed or feel humiliated. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the terrible thing. All right. And, and so make peace with that, that yes, I mean, there's nothing wrong with wanting to do well, but you can't let a race or a single event define how, how you are and who you are. Right. And, and, and so identify the thought and then identify a thought that you could replace that with that would not make you feel anxious. A actually an absence of thought would be preferable, but that's hard to do. Right. Mm -hmm. Not, thinking. I mean, we, so we know when we're, at the top of our game, when we're in the zone, in the flow, the mind is really quiet. So, I mean, another way to think about this as a competitive runner, let's say you're in the middle of a race and you're doing really well. What is there to think about? You, you, you could argue not much of anything because what, what you're doing is, is you're looking, you're using your senses and you're reacting to what's happening, right? E even at the highest level of competition, right? If you're, say you're in a marathon and and you're going to run with a pack of guys that you know the winner's going to come from. If that pack makes a move, you might say, well, I've got to go with them now, right? Mm -hmm. That's, But that's not really so much a thought. That's a reaction, right? Or you pay attention to your body, and if your body, you know, feels good, you know, then you might move. If your body's not feeling good, you might stay where you're at. Mm -hmm. But just really paying attention to what's going on around you is much preferable to doing a lot of thinking, right? So I tell people, uh, this is this is why I think people like to run with music, right? Is because it kind of gets them out of the head. So you can do that if you're an anxious person. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, is to pay attention to the other people in the race, right? So one of the things that I talked about in the book, and I think even talked about with some of your guys is, is great competitors use the other people in the race to help them go faster, mm -hmm. right? So it might be something as, as, as simple as, you know, you're running a race and a person came, comes up beside you and passes you, you know, and you kind of look at the person and then, you know, maybe they're older than you or, you know, you don't think they're as good a shape as you are. And you say to yourself, there's no way in hell I'm going to let this person. <laughs> and then you stay with them. I mean, that's fine. But, you know, thinking about what can go wrong in a race is, is going to cheat you out of the joy of running which I would say for most recreational runners, that's the whole reason to run, right? Is for the physical health consequences and the mental health consequences, which are both significant, mm -hmm. right? So don't go doing all the work, you know, and then cheat yourself out of the benefit of it. Right. The race is really the celebration. And so we should be excited about the celebration, not anxious about the celebration of it. And uh, typically that'll allow, allow us to perform better. It, and it does. We, we know that, that, you know, being in a race with other people, it is going to push you to get the best out of you. Mm -hmm. and, and that's fun and, 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 and a joyful thing. Is it hard? Yes. Is it uncertain? Yes. But everything in life worth doing is both hard and uncertain, I would argue. Very well put. Well, Dr. Stan, thanks so much. Uh, everybody watching, I'll put links. Uh, Dr. Stan's got a video that's available. Uh, you can check that out. And then his book, Elite Minds, I'll put a link to that as well underneath this video. And this is just a start. Uh, we'll continue these conversations talking about sort of getting your head right going into training and racing. But Dr. Stan, thanks so much. Great to see you, buddy. And we'll talk again soon. Thanks, Greg. I enjoyed it. Yep. Take care, man.